Hello, friends. Uh, today, uh, it's my pleasure to invite you to this uh, session on optimized PCI in real-world complex lesion. You all realize that uh, as we have uh, continued to get more and more complex patients, uh, outcomes for these patients become the paramount important. Certainly, many of our devices have grown better to get better results. For example, strength stents have improved in both their architecture as well as their thickness of the struts, so they're thinner now and give us good results. And certainly the outcomes are getting better and better in terms of le less mace over a follow-up period. But what's getting more important is to improve even beyond that, to even get better with our results, with our on-table results, which could influence the outcome. And that is what we mean by optimized PCI. When a patient leaves our cath lab, he should have not just had the best tent, not just have the best technique, but also to have had the best results to improve long-term outcomes. And therefore, the objective of the session today is to understand the role of coronary physiology in improving clinical outcomes in real-world complex lesions, to learn the algorithm of coronary imaging to achieve optimized outcomes in complex PCI, and finally, to utilize these imaging modalities, especially OCT, for decision-making during PCI for the best outcomes for our patients of complex PCI. And I have a great team and of an expert panel for, for, for the discussion. We have Dr. Subhash Chandra from New Delhi, India. We have Dr. Sanjeev Roy from Jaipur, India. And we have Dr. Srinivas Kumar from Hyderabad, India. With these words, I now go on to the first talk on the role of assessing coronary physiology to improve outcomes in real-world complex lesions by Dr. Rajesh Vijayvargia. Over to you, Rajesh. Thanks, AICT Asia PCR for the invitation and an opportunity to deliver the talk on role of assessing coronary physiology to improve outcome in real-world complex uh, lesions. I do not have any conflict of interest regarding this presentation. FFR is a gold standard to assess the functional significance of coronary stenosis. And if you see the accuracy of FFR in comparison to other modality, uh, the coronary angiography do have now around 65% accuracy while resting PD by PA and also the single cutoff IFR do have an accuracy of only 80% while FFR have now 100% efficacy for the functional assessment of the coronary lesion. There are uh, initial randomized trial, that's the prospective randomized one, which has assessed the role of FFR in chronic stable angina with a cutoff value of 0.8, and it's been found in FAME and FAME 2 trial. That the mace rate uh, at the one year is significantly less in those who has been subjected with the FFR-guided PCI compared to angiography-guided PCI. And it's been found at five-year follow-up that those who have been subjected for FFI-guided PCI, there is the advantage, overall advantage, and there is no excess of MI mortality and also the revascularization of FFR-guided PCI patients. And it's also been found that around one-third of the patients who were found to have an angiography-guided significant lesion turned out to be insignificant with the FFR value 0.8 on FFR assessment. So there is a significant difference in the decision making to work for the PCA with the help of FFR. Regarding the syntax score, uh, a significant percentage of patients do turn up from say low to high, vis-a-vis well, -vis high to low risk group, around 32% from high group to low risk uh, group get turned up following the functional assessment. And this also lead to change in the management part. Uh, there is a significant change in the patient cohort, which is to be subjected for say medical treatment, PCA or CAVG, and it also result into the different maze rate at one year of follow-up. So FFR do help in uh, improving the clinical outcome in patients who have been subjected for functional assessment followed by coronary intervention. Uh, 
The guideline also favors that the FFR guided PCI should be done in patients with the chronic stable angina if the if the angiographic stenosis is of intermediate type extending from 50 to 90 percent with no inducible ischemia being demonstrated prior to taking the patient on the table. Regarding the acute myocardial infarction and the intervention of non-infarct-related artery, there are two trials, DENAMI-3 and also the COMPARE ACUTE in which the non-infarct-related artery PCI has been done with the FFR guidance and it's been found in the meta-analysis that FFR-guided PCI or non-infarct-related artery along with the primary PCI lead to significant reduction of maze and it's mainly because of significant reduction in repeat revascularization. Though the rate of all cause mortality and also the myocardial infarction remain the similar in both the group. What happened to the deferred lesion in acute current syndrome? It's been found that the clinical outcome of those who had a deferred lesion in acute current syndrome is different than the stable angina patient. The FAME 2 trial, uh, which has a five year follow up, has shown a favorable outcome of chronic stable angina patient, even up to the extent of five years. But the story is something different for those with acute current syndrome, and target lesion failure is around 6% at one year, 9% at two years, and 12% at three years of follow up. And it's been also found that around 75% of these patients with the median interval of 15 months have an acute coronary syndrome in case they are deferred on the basis of FFR negative, non-infarct related or non-target uh, uh, lesion revascularization. A comparison between the chronic stable angina and acute coronary syndrome in uh, in one of the study by Hakim A. et al. has shown that at 3.4 year of follow-up MI and target vision uh, revascularization rate were significantly higher in those with acute coronary syndrome compared to those with a chronic stable angina, though there is no difference in cardiovascular death and total mortality. <clears throat> Recently, the role of FFR has come up in the post-PCI patient to have an assessment of uh, stented segment, and it's been found that uh, a FFR value of less than 0.9 is one which is suboptimal, and uh, less than 0.8 is not required. It has to be more than 0.8 following the PCA. A low FFR following the stent implantation can be because of the diffuse disease outside the stented segment under expansion, severe as dissection, tissue prolapse, or residual thrombosis. And it's do have an independent predictor or target uh, vessel failure to get the follow-up. And any actual gain in the FFR volume following is tending to have a favorable prognostic value. So let me present a few cases about the role of FFR in a complex coronary intervention. The first case is about side branch assessment. A 60-year-old hypertensive chronic liver female Chronic liver disease female presented with increasing angina from last two months, having the intermittent episode of uh, rest angina. Clinical examination unremarkable. ECG was uh, normal other than the frequent VPC and ECO was normal. The coronary angiography did show the left circumflex, which is normal. Ostium, the left circumflex is okay, proximal to mid LED, including the ostium is calcified and having around 80% stenosis. So before going ahead for the PCA of osteal LED from left main to LED crossover stenting, a side branch osteal LCX was assessed with divers and it's been found that the area is 6.12 millimeter square at the ostium of the LCX and then FFR value is 0.96 and this is the run of divers across the osteal LCX which uh, did not show any significant lesion. So this patient underwent uh, PCI from left main to LED with a provisional standing 1.5 millimeter rota bar followed by the cutting balloon dilatation of the LED and two overlapping stand 3.524 synergy and 3 into 33 giant systems were deployed from left main to LED. I was guided post uh, stenting optimization was performed. And if you see the osteal LCX, which is uh, somewhat uh, pinched, uh, was dilated with a 2.5 millimeter balloon. And uh, this is the final result across the across the left coron system, which has shown a good flow across the left coron system. And the osteal LCX is also fine angiographically. 
A reassessment of the hostel and six did show the area, which is 6.04 millimeter square. And I was run across the hostel and six did come from a good, uh, uh, good luminal area without any dissection. And the uh, FFR, which was performed across the LCX, did show the value of 0.89, which is quite favorable. Another case. Uh, a 77-year-old hypertensive diabetic male, a known case of chronic stable angina of the medical treatment from last five years, presented with a recent worsening of the angina from last two months. Clinical examination unremarkable. ECG was normal, echo was normal. And this is the coronary angiogram, which showed the LAD, which is disease, though it doesn't seem to be significant on angiography. It's around uh, less than 70% stenosis, though it's a calcified one. And uh, this is the RCA. If you see the mid part of the RCA, which seems to be having a significant 70% stenosis. And uh, on the basis of the angiography, it was uh, decided that possibly it's the RCA, which is the culprit uh, vessel leading to angina and not the uh, LAD. However, the FFR was done across both the vessel LAD and the RCA. It was found that the FFR is 0.78 across the LAD, while it's 0.84 across the RCA. And it's been decided to go ahead with the uh, PCA of the LAD uh, alone. And uh, this is uh, what the left main to LAD crossover is standing with the rotabulation was done. And a 3.538 millimeter synergy stand was de deployed and OCT optimization was done. This is the final result from left main to LED crossover stenting. You can have a look on good flow across the left corner system with the preservation of all the side branches. And here is the OCT imaging across left main to LED, which shows a good expansion, good area, well position of the stent, and then FFR across the stented segment is 0.92. It's been the suggested that the area, the FFR value should be more than 0.9 in uh, those lesion here. It's the calcified lesion, but we could achieve a good area across and the FFR value is also significantly on the higher side. The last one, means in the deferred lesion of the coronary artery disease, a 59-year-old non-diabetic normal tensi male presented with a stable angina in October 2017. ECO and ECG was normal, and this is the angiogram which showed the mid LAD significant disease. Hostel LAD is not so significant, it's around 60 to 70 percent. For the mid LAD, we did the PCA and a 3.538 millimeter stent was deployed. Hostel LAD was assessed at that moment of time and was found to have an FFR value of 0.82, hence, the lesion was deferred. And this time uh, he again presented after three years with the angina and a coronary angiography revealed the significant osteal disease, a FFR value across the proximal LAD is 0.77. There is an additional OM disease, which has now FFR value of 0.74 and the osteal or proximal LCX has an FFR value of 0.82. So this patient underwent uh, left main bifurcation standing using two stent and mini crust technique with the OCT optimization and the good end result. So in conclusion, the FFR guided PCA has a favorable long-term outcome, especially those with a stable coronary artery disease. It's an important tool in catheterization lab for functional assessment of the lesion, side branches assessment like in the left main bifurcation disease, known culprit vessel in acute coronary syndrome, and also in the post-PCA optimization. A combination of intravascular Imaging with the functional assessment should be an ultimate goal, especially in those with a complex coronary intervention. Thanks for kind attention. That was that was a great talk by Professor Rajesh Vijayvargi. I mean, it encompassed a lot of aspects. Uh, just let me ask you, Subhash, uh, for ambiguous left main, you know, you have this left main which is 60%, 70%, can't be certain about it. When would you use FFR uh, and how would you use it? So, uh, Dr. Seth, uh, thanks for asking this question. For left main, uh, FFR is definitely a very important tool and it earns class 1A indication even for left main assessment. Uh, the caution which you have to observe here is that you have to take FFR in both the vessels that is LED as well as circumflex and of course with the hyperemic protocol, especially if the, if the resting RFR is uh, in excess of 0.80 or so. 
So that is how we conduct an FR. One has to take caution that one need not uh, disengage the guiding from the left main ostium and then invite the fallacies into its assessment. So for left main, I'm sure this is a very important tool to assess the significance whenever you have a doubt. And then, of course, one can proceed on to do some kind of imaging if there are any doubts left. Okay. And would you use intravenous infusion of adenosine or are you fine with boluses? What gives you the best uh, results in your, in your practice? Uh, in our practice, we are fine with bolus. Uh, I, I embrace giving bolus intracoronary rather than going with the systemic adenosine infusion. So, Sanjeev, coming to, coming to the use of uh, physiology, and I tell you, physiology is how we need to proceed if we want to give best to our patients and most appropriate to our patients. In fact, is the most important appropriate use criteria of PCI in any lesion. Now, let me ask you, post-stent implantation, how do you use it in your practice, uh, physiology in post-stent situations? Immediately you've implanted a stent, uh, do, is it... You do, do, you, do you regularly use FFR? Uh, and what do you use it for after stent implantation? Sir, it's a very uh, good and interesting question that you have asked. And this is the field where the physiology has been most underutilized, particularly the post-stenting. Uh, in my practice, uh, when I do it, I mean, you have a FFR wire on the table and it should be, uh, we should encourage everybody to use it. And uh, more so in the diffuse disease, where it is very important because sometimes uh, you may not be able to get the desired values even after stenting. And uh, again, it's very important that the delta change uh, before and uh, after, uh, at particularly at the stent age, should be more than uh, 0.02. It's very important for the delta factor. Uh, again, there are lesions where, you know, you want a deferred stenting strategy where it is an intermediate lesion. You have uh, stented the uh, culprit lesion. You want to reassess the other lesion. Again, post-stenting, it should be done particularly in the serial uh, lesions where you have uh, this kind of challenges. Uh, I think uh, this is an aspect which we often neglect. We do not use post-stenting. And a cutoff value of anything above 0.89 should be acceptable even in the most challenging cases. That's, that's a great, great. And in fact, putting that into perspective where you said, you know, there's serial lesions and to diagnose the significance of a borderline lesion when you stented a most serious lesion downstream is one of the very valuable adjuncts to, to our understanding of lesions and, and appropriateness of PCI in those lesions. Thank you very much. I think it's, uh, we will proceed on to the next uh, uh, talk. And uh, our next talk is utilizing OCT, MLD Max algorithm for precision PCI in complex lesions. And uh, this is going to be by Pratap Kumar uh, from uh, India. Over to you, Pratap. Let's hear you. Today we are talking about the OCT algorithm, MLD Max. We are talking about the morphology linked to dimetrium in pre-PCI in post-PCI dissection, acquisition, and expansion. We are thinking about morphology linked and dimetrium in pre so the pre-PCI strategies. So we will look at if the lumen is well seen, then it is actually, we don't have to worry about that. It can be in the normal lumen or a fibrous tissue. If the lumen or the wall is abnormal, the lumen is abnormal, can be red thrombus or white thrombus. If the wall is abnormal, can be light wood or calcium. So the calcium, we can have a strategy of lipoprich, fibrotic plaque, and calcified body, we have to put atherectomy. So in calcified, it can be nodular, superficial, or deep. So we will be looking at the calcium score. And the length is actually decided by the landing zone in both uh, post and the, both the pre and the post part. Diameter we will be assessing with the AEL as well as lumen. And the strategy we'll be looking at AEL is not well seen. You have to look for the lumen, but if it should be under upper, upper, upsize these sides. The same is for the pre dilatation balloon also. So, in the length and diameter, the stent sizing decides. So we'll look at the morphology, length, diameter. Post-PCI, we'll look at the optimized vessel. 
you look at the determined the strength expansion and it's safe. So we'll be looking at the medial dissection. If there is a dissection extending greater than more than one quadrant, you have to go for the balloon stent in flat, additional stent. For that position, if it is more than three millimeter or more than 0.3 millimeter from the ball, you have to use a semi-compliant balloon. Expansion, you have to use a post non-compliant balloon. So the EEN is identified with the reference diameter with under expansion to allow the vessel diameter. So the post PCA, you look at the avoidance of the significant stent of the dissection irregular tissue protrusion. So the post PCI, dissection, apposition, and expansion look into. We'll be doing the first case. It's an enstomy with a good LV function. We'll go into the slides. So the left system is showing a significant block. Next. So we can see, and actually in a, uh, there is a, a problem in the distal circum distal LMCA. You can see an abnormality or irregularity. It can be dissection flap, calcium, thrombus, or insignificant plaque. We did an IVUS to the lady as to less circumflex. With the LMC is showing actually, the IVUS showing a calcified nodule in the sarcostium. We can see the calcified nodule nicely. The same can be identified with LAD to LMC also. So we did a rotoblation 1.75 and the 4 to 12 millimeter below. Then we did an OCT. Post rotor, same similar picture. Similar to the previous and pre and post rotor, similar picture in IVUS. We identified in OCT, there is a significant difference. We can identify the thrombus overlying the calcium. So what we have done is a wrong statement with the IVUS. Actually, if you would have done an OCT, it would have been a totally different picture. We did a mini crush technique. Wire recross, five to 12 millimeter balloon final part. Post ending, excellent apposition. Post ending, both I was and LED same. We did an OCT to both the vessels. We identified the well expanded stent. We can see an excellent diameter. We can see an even 3D bifurcation. Even in circumflex lumen profile, we can very well see. So this is actually a circumflex stent protrusion. You can see a little 3D bifurcation. It's run through. We can see a different uh, malaposition of actually very well malaposition is well seen in these OCT. We did one more post dilatation and there's a final result. We will go to the next case. We can see the LED was opened up with the stent, but suppose the RCA was totally occluded. We did a balloon dilatation. We did a wire passed, but no, no, nothing was crossing. Only the wire is crossed with the gas second. We did a balloon, nothing is going. We tried with a balloon, then we tried with the anger balloon technique, but we shifted to rotor wire. So the rotor wire identified is actually from the particular injection, identified the rotor wire was in the right place. We did a rotor, starting from the proximal to the distal, 1.5 bar is used. 
went up to the RPLB. So we actually seen balloon dilatation, multiple balloon dilatation. We did an OCT. OCT was showing next. We can see a significant block with a lot of calcium. We can see the proximal RCA was the calcium score was four with uh, more than uh, arc of 180 with a length of more than 0.5 millimeters. You can see the significant calcium there throughout. I can see that even the exit dissection. You can see the empty dissection. You can see uh, there is a, a hematoma also inside. So we can see the mid RC also the same calcium score of four. We still are seeing the same calcium score. We did three stents, 3.5, 3 and 2.75. Post dilatation, we did an OCT again. Well, post stent throughout. It is actually showing a definite expansion on the proximal to the distal by the OCT and it was very well displayed in this case. So we could identify the OCT is one of the biggest tools to identify the expansion in the position in this case compared to IBIS. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Pratap Kumar. That was a, a very nice collection of cases demonstrating the advantages of OCT over what could not be seen in IBIS. Uh, so let me talk to you, Srinivas. Uh, left main, uh, OCT, is it that a preferred option in your practice? And how do you actually do OCT and say, image the ostia of the left main? Uh, that always comes to mind, you know. Uh, that's one of those areas where different people want to use different uh, imaging modalities. Thank you, Dr. Steele, for the question. Actually, as far as the imaging of left main is concerned, both the shaft and the bifurcation, we can image it very well by OCT imaging. And as uh, shown by Pratap, there, should, there will not be any ambiguity left, like with IBUS sometimes. Uh, people could argue saying that uh, for the ostium of the left main, where there could be some challenges, when the guide catheter engages, you could uh, get damping and a wash out of blood won't happen, imaging may not uh, happen. But even in that scenario, nowadays we try to take uh, guideline and guide extension catheters and uh, try to keep it in so that uh, we can get imaging even with osteum. But I would agree, the osteal left main, I think, where is the still IVAS scores uh, and the latest HD uh, high definition IVAS catheters could image better. But for the shaft and the bifurcation, especially when you're planning two stent technique, and it also helps in uh, wire, wire with wiring the distal with a strut or proximal strut, and uh, with the struts are across, uh, across the branch of LCX, and all that minute uh, important information is obtained uh, very well by OCT imaging. I think uh, all of us uh, should become comfortable with this modality. And uh, that's how we believe in optimizing the results uh, for the left male. And Dr. Subhash Chandra, uh, do you have any tips and tricks for, for patients with uh, renal dysfunction? There's always a concern of giving repeated injections of contrast while doing OCT. Uh, right. So, uh, Dr. Said, that's a perpetual apprehension when it comes to OCT that the contrast load worries you in terms of the renal dysfunction. So, some of the tips could be that uh, one can avoid taking angiographic runs and with this co-registration facility, one can club the OCT acquisition with the angiographic acquisition at the same time. The other could be using some alternate uh, diffusing materials like uh, the dextran, or uh, the non-contrast materials, sometimes even saline runs have been there, although they have not been validated in comparison to the contrast uh, diffused uh, areas or the dimensions. So that is one caveat, but yes, uh, half contrast, half saline or dextran runs could also give you reasonable images in such cases where one cannot avoid uh, the taking help sure. of OCT. Sure, That's and you could thing. decrease the amount of contrast. You're absolutely right. No repeat runs. Uh, just use OCT runs as your images 
and that could be just fine. Uh, thank you. I think uh, we will go on to the next uh, talk, uh, and that is uh, by that's on the impact of imaging in decision making and uh, strategy in calcified and bifurcation lesions. Just some of the stuff that we were talking about, and that's by Ronnie Matthew. Over to you, Ronnie. It'd be very interested in listening to you on these two aspects of uh, of complex anatomy. Thank you for inviting me to this session. So I'm going to speak on the impact of OCT imaging in decision-making and strategy in bifurcation lesions. I have nothing to disclose as far as this presentation is concerned. So now, imaging in bifurcation is important because bifurcation is basically a complex three-dimensional structure. And as you realize, conventional angiogram is a two-dimensional and therefore has an inherent limitation in the quantitative assessment. Now, OCT has a clear advantage compared to angiography in the sense, A, it depicts your osteal lesions like what you see over here without the misleading 2D appearance. And it has an ability to reconstruct three-dimensionally the side branch. So with that, you'll be able to get a clearer view of the main vessel, distal vessel, and the side branch in bifurcation. So I'm going to do this lecture and tell you where the decision-making is important. And as far as I'm concerned, it's there in side branch assessment, in the wire recross, in checking the struts across the side branch, and in doing an optimal kiss. So how does OCT benefit us? And I'm going to go through some of my examples to show you this. Now, when you come to a wire cross in a provisional strategy, choosing the right cell matters. Because you got to do a distal cross, a distal cell cross when you do a provisional. And the reason you do a distal cell cross is because as you see here, the stem strut gets pulled down to the side of the side branch and it displaces two of these struts to the inner curvature and provides a metallic flap. Let us see this example of a Medina 111. We do a main vessel and a pot. You get a decent result. But if you look at this OCT image, you see there's a strut right across the side branch. So we did a distal cross here. You look at the distality. The wire is crossing distal to the stent strut. And that's how it looks. You open it. You kiss it. And that's the final result. And on the OCT, it looks like this. The struts have been pushed away. You look at the previous picture. There were struts there. The strut has been pushed away, and you get a very nice scaffold onto the side branch. Now, in a crash strategy, on the other hand, you got to do a proximal and a center cell cross. I believe it should be a center cell cross, and I will tell you why. The reason why you should not do a distal is what I've been trying to show over here. If you cross abluminally and you open the balloon, you would push the strut, abluminal strut, proximally, and you will get an area that is uncovered, like what you see over here, and a significant gap. And that is why you do a proximal and a center cell cross. Now, let us see. One of the things in which I did a center cross, or what I call as a mid-cross, and that's a DK crush. Let me go through the steps. Now, that's a 0, 1, 1. So you do a side branch stage first. Then you open that well, crush it. You do the first recross, you kiss after the first recross, implant the main vessel stent, do a pot, and then do a final recross. Now here we did a mid recross. Now that is how a mid recross looks on a 3D. You see the wire going exactly in the mid strut. And once we got this mid recross, you did a kiss, Result looks phenomenal, and that is how on 3D it appears. You have no strut at the carina because you have done a mid-cross and you have pushed all the struts to the side. On the other hand, and this is where I want to show you this very interesting fact. If you do a proximal cross, like in this patient with a 1-1-1, again with a DK crush, we did the side branch stenting first, and then we crushed the side branch stent, recrossed it, and then subsequently went and put a main vessel stent, 
and then subsequently again crossed here. Now, if you look at this, this is a proximal cross that we have done. Now, how does this proximal cross look? Now, we did a kiss here. The result looks exceptional. But if you look at this proximal cross, when we have crossed it proximally, the struts have been pushed to the carina, and you see a metallic neocarina here. On 3D, you see here the metal at the neocarina, while the other part, it's okay. And on 3D, as I show, I want to show you here, this is before we did the kiss, you're on a proximal cross, as you can see very nicely over here. And after the proximal cross, when you do a kiss, you push these struts over here and you get a huge metallic neocarina. Therefore, I believe even in a DK crush, you must do a mid cross and not a proximal cross because a proximal cross will get you a metallic neocarina as is shown here. Now, next, let me talk to you about the struts across the side branch in provisional. Now, this is a question that has been asked. Is a routine kiss necessary in a provisional strategy? When you do a main vessel stenting, should you come out with a kiss? Now, this is how the OCT looks. If you're lucky, you'll have no strut across the side branch. If you're unlucky, you will find these struts across the side branch. And I believe that you must kiss this and push these struts out of the side branch. The reason... Though all these angiograms look perfectly good, these struts will cause a problem. This is the example that I'm going to show you. One of the cases which had an LM to LED lesion, as you can see over here, the FFR was 0.7. And when we did the OCT, there was a lesion going right into the left main, the thin cap fibroethroma, though we had an 8.8 .8 millimeter square area. So we decided to go and do a left main to LED stenting. So we did that, got a good result, looks exceptional in all the views. We did an OCT, and the OCT also looks good. Three-dimensional picture is this. You see a strut lying across the side branch ostium, though the l sucks ostium looks exceptionally good. So we left this patient alone. And 28 months later, he has angina. And if you look at this angio, you find a filling defect at the circumflex ostium. Can't see very well. So when we did an OCT, this is what you see. When you run from LED to LM, you see the ostium of the circumflex is divided in two. When we do a run an OCT from the circumflex, you again see two ostias. On a 3D picture, it looks like this. While this was the original 3D picture. So what has happened here is that you had a neo-intimal growth over these struts. And the single ostia was converted to two ostia with flow limitation in angina. This is not the only case. We had multiple cases like this. And there's another case that I wanted to show you where a LM to LED cipher stent was put in. And if you look at the fly-through image, the circumflex ostia has again been converted into three ostia. And this is what is called as a fenestrated restenosis. Our case was shown at the 15th consensus document at the EBC and uh, the suggested that we must move the struts out of the side branch ostium. And lastly, let me come to the optimal kiss. Now, this is a, another DKC, uh, 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 DK crush for the LAD D1. So we did the side branch stenting. We did the first crush. We again crossed it. We kissed it. We did the main vessel stent. And we did a port before we decided to cross here. So we tried, we crossed it, but unfortunately, the balloon doesn't go through that stent strut. And this is something that you would have seen happens. You look at the, 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 the 3D picture on the OCT, and this is what you see. Struts crowded all over the side branch ostia, and that's the wire, and that's why the balloon doesn't go. So you just do another pot, and that's what you did with a larger size balloon. Here, a 3.75. And once you do that, you see the struts have been removed from the ostium, and it helps you do take a balloon in and do a kiss much easier. So a perspective from the OCT where a pot helps you in recrossing, and you do a kiss, and this is the final result that you get. So to conclude, 
how has OCT image impacted decision making in bifurcation? And I think the answer depends on which side you are on, whether you do imaging or not. Though we have no hard endpoints, we have the October trial that's coming. There's some registry data to show reduction in MACE. It definitely improved our technique, our perspective on pot, tap, and DKC, side branch recrossing, and awareness of strut issues, as I showed. What I did not show and did not have time is the precision implantation with the MLD Max uh, protocol. And most importantly, you understand bifurcation failures with an optical code and stomography. Thank you all for your kind attention and thank you for the invitation. Thank you, uh, Ronnie. That, those are very, very fascinating pictures and a clear representation of what's happening when we treat bifurcation lesions and especially when we don't see as expected uh, and the cases don't go as expected. It really has given us tremendous insight. Uh, so Sanjeev, uh, uh, we didn't talk about calcified lesions, uh, but I think it's very important to talk about them. Uh, do you use uh, uh, OCT in your practice for calcified lesions? What do you like to see? What does it tell you? And how does it change your approach to calcified lesions? So imaging has a major role to play when it comes to the calcified lesion. Uh, the first thing is we need to profile the calcium, whether it is the uh, the covering the intimal surface or it is quite deep. The length of the calcium calcified segment, the depth of the calcium uh, calcified segment, although these are equally visible in both uh, the IVERS as well as the OCT. But what makes the difference between the two is we are uh, better able to, you know, profile the thickness of the calcium in OCT. And thickness matters because if the thickness is more than 0.5 mm, it is not going to be amenable to balloon dilatation. And that's where the decision for the plaque modification, more so if the arc is more than uh, 270 or 180 to 270, uh, the length is more than five millimeter, you have a calcium scoring because these are going to have a suboptimal result if we do not modify the plug and uh, the stent won't expand. And obviously, the mace and the restenosis will be higher in such cases. Sure, uh, no, no, I, I, I agree. And the visualization of calcium is 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 clear. It's uh, it's very clear, and it actually helps to guide many of our strategies, especially with the number of devices that we have. So, so uh, uh, Srinivas, can you just uh, explain to all of us uh, what is an underexpanded stent on OCT? What is a residual stenosis? What do you mean by optimization uh, in terms of uh, OCT analysis? Uh, that's a very important question. And uh, uh, OCT made, uh, imaging made all the difference there. If you see what is the most important parameter which uh, results the outcomes, obviously there are many. But if you see the Kamala position versus uh, a proper expansion, the expansion of the stent is what which is, uh, comes out to be most important. Uh, what do you mean by under expansion? As you asked, you compare the stent, the proximal uh, normal segment and the distal normal segment. If you see, then probably the lesion site, which is in center, when the generally stents tend to expand in hourglass shape. That's how we tend to post dilate in the center. So if you the, if you see the narrowed segment compared to the proximal and the distal uh, so-called normal segments, uh, how much difference is in the diameter uh, compared to those segments? What we assess. What we tend to aim is to at least get more than 80% of the expansion. That means even 10, 20% of a little under expansion is that too, in spite of you trying your best with all the opium balloons, other things, sometimes you will be left with some under expansion of the stent. But what we want is actually if it is like a straight tube without any under expansion in between, that is 100% of the throw of the stent expands exactly like a tube rather than our glass, uh, to understand in a normal language. But that is very well demonstrated, again, by OCT. Even if you put the opposition markers, uh, then it also shows clearly. And you can scroll the you know, button to see from the proximal extent to mid-extent to the distal extent. There could be slightly, because the vessels tend to be uh, coning down uh, distally, uh, that uniform uh, thing is OK. But at, at one particular point, stent going indentating inside and getting a focal Underexpanded portion is what a big, big no in our uh, optimization procedures. I think uh, that's how uh, if you get 100% expansion without any uh, indentation on the stent is what we aim at. 
uh, though sometimes very high calcific lesions, you could accept uh, minimal under expansion, but our aim is to have it 100% expanded. People also thought about molar position, whether how important it is. Molar position is also uh, very clearly demonstrated by the OCT imaging because of quality of sure. it is so good. So about That's 3 mm right. position is what is generally thought to be acceptable. But out of the two, expansion of the stent is the most important, which we tend to should get 100% as possible. That's right. And the residual stenosis. I think it's very important to do away with it as best as possible. So now, I think we've had a great session. Uh, we've actually gone through understanding FFR and physiology in acute myocardial infarction in the non-culprit vessels. We've understood the pre-stent implantation uh, and ambiguous left main, FFR and ambiguous left main. And we've also stood the understood the value of physiology measurement by FFR in post-stent implantation situations. I think that's an important and emerging area. Uh, we've understood the flow pathways. We've understood the flow pathways using OCT analysis and certainly understood by some great examples of superiority of OCT over some of the other imaging modalities, especially for, for, uh, for pathophysiology like thrombus, uh, like calcification. And of course, finally, we actually did see some great images uh, of, of uh, OCT for decision making in bifurcation lesions. I think we've truly achieved the learning objectives that we started out from. We've certainly benefited a lot from this interaction. I think this has been a great interaction. It's been a great learning experience for all of us here. And I hope that you all have also benefited from this learning experience. I hope you've enjoyed this session and we look forward to more sessions with you. Thank you very much for attending the AICT Asia PCR. Thank you.